Madam Speaker, as always, I am deeply honoured to rise in this House and speak for the people of Timmins James Bay. And I will be speaking tonight on Bill C-58 to express my deep, deep concern about this government's attack on the access to information system. For the folks back home, they may not pay a lot of attention to access to information because it is the stuff of journalists, it's the stuff of researchers, uh, it's the stuff of opposition politics. But access to information is one of the fundamental principles of an accountable democracy. Because in order to hold government to account, you need to know who was involved when the decisions in the back room were made. You need to have some manner of light shone into the dark rooms where the power brokers are to ensure a level of accountability. And that's the role of the Access to Information Act. And at one point, Canada was well respected for the Access to Information Act that was brought in a number of decades ago. But year by year, Canada has slipped in its level of credibility. And we're going to be talking about some specific examples of how that plays out tonight. But we're in a situation now, Madam Speaker, where we have a Prime Minister who won so much support across this country because the very first step that he took offering his vision as new leader was on access to information and open government and showing that his vision for Parliament would be the opposite of the Stephen Harper government, which was considered so controlling and so secretive. And people put their trust in this Prime Minister. And I remember at the time thinking, this is really bold. A leader who's willing to make the changes necessary for access to information. Because I've grown increasingly concerned, Madam Speaker, that our Parliament more and more has become a sideshow that has become a Potemkin democracy where we as MPs get to play out in the House, but the real decisions are being made to benefit those who are not accountable. And that's why when the Prime Minister makes a promise on access to information and then undermines it in such a cynical manner that I think Canadians have a right to know how this is happening and how it affects them. So Bill C-58, which is supposed to be the bill to uh, change the access to information laws in this country. We have the President of Treasury Boards getting up and saying, don't worry, now Canadians will have access to the mandate letters of the ministers. Uh, what, that wasn't already public? And don't worry, now they'll get to know the travel uh, budgets of various ministers when that is already public. But what we don't have is the ability, in this case, for the Access to Information Commissioner to ensure that all documents are posted. Because one thing we found with government is if certain documents are not all that helpful to them, like when the minister, remember the Minister for Indigenous Services who racked up all those thousands of dollars riding around Markham in a limousine? That's embarrassing to government. They don't want that released. So if you allow government to release what they want, they will not release what's embarrassing. But you need accountability. And so I'm going to talk about C-58 in context of a couple specific cases so people understand exactly what we're talking about. And I'm going to talk about the issue of St. Anne's Residential School because as this government is leading their attack to limit the ability of people to access information, uh, I am dealing with the Access to Information Commissioner on the three and a half year obstruction by federal officials in the Justice Department to suppress and black out who made key decisions regarding the Justice Department's response to the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School. And in telling this story, you begin to understand why it is so important that we have an accountable system for access to information. But I'm Speaker, St. Anne's Residential School was in my region, the rep region that I represent in the community of Fort Albany. If you look at the horrific history of the residential schools, the story of what was done to the children at St. Anne's, year in, year out, generation upon generation, uh, stands as amongst the most horrifying stories in this country's history, a veritable concentration camp of torture and sexual abuse of children. And in 1992, the survivors of St. Anne's came together in Fort Albany to talk about their experience. 
And for the first time, many of them began to talk about the levels of sexual abuse and rape and forced abortions that the children were subjected to. And Edmund Matatawaban, who was chief, brought this to the Ontario Provincial Police and demanded a major police investigation. And to their credit, the Ontario Provincial Police, with Sergeant Delgadis in the Cochrane Division, undertook a massive investigation of the crimes committed against those children. They identified over 180 perpetrators of rape and torture and abuse of children. They gathered a thousand witness statements to that abuse from the survivors and from the students who were there. They gathered 12,000 pages of police testimony and documentation, including subpoenaing records from the Catholic Church and the Diocese of Moussigny to build a picture of what went on in that institution year in, year out. And in 2003, there was an effort with the survivors and the then federal government, uh, I believe, of Paul Martin to sit down and try and find a solution. And the survivors were so shocked at the aggression of the federal government to fight and deny every single case, no matter what the evidence. And at that time, Madam Speaker, all the police evidence that had been gathered in Ontario and had led to a number of convictions in Ontario court against perpetrators of the abuse at St. Anne's, and let's face it, the big ones got away. The priests, the bishops who were involved, uh, they got away. Some of them were dead. Some of them some of the perpetrators couldn't be found, but a number of people were convicted in Ontario court. But that trove of evidence was approached by the Justice Department in 2004 to get access to that to prepare the defense for the number one defendant, and the defendant was Canada. And when they applied to get access to this police documentation, they said to Ontario Superior Court that it would be unfair for Canada who was in charge of this institution. It would be unfair for Canada to prepare its defense if it didn't have all the evidence. And so the key officials in the Justice Department were involved in that application to obtain those records. And they got the records. 12,000 pages, they got the names of the perpetrators. They were preparing for major civil uh, litigation and, and trials that were to, to come against Canada. In 2007, 2008, the process for the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement was set up as an alternative so the federal government could escape these cases. And what the federal government agreed to at that time was to set up the Independent Assessment Process, the IEP. The IAP was to be a non-confrontational process where the survivors could come and tell their story. Well, that's how they told the survivors it would play out. Of course, it didn't play out like that at all for the survivors of St. Anne's. And so the role of the Justice Department, they wore two hats. The first hat was to obtain all the evidence, prepare it into what were so-called narratives, so that the adjudicators and the claimant lawyers could use to make it easier for the claimants. So the Justice Department acted as the gatherer of evidence, and the Justice Department put on its other hat, it was still the lawyer for the defendant for Canada, and its number one goal was limiting the payouts. So in the case of St. Anne's Residential School, they had an obligation to prepare the list of all the documentation listing all the known crimes and sexual abuse that occurred in that institution. And they presented to the hearings a document that said there is no, no, no known history of sexual abuse at Fort Albany uh, Indian Residential School, St. Anne's. They said there was absolutely no documentation to show any student-on-student -student abuse at the Fort Albany Institution of St. Anne's. And so people came in to tell their stories, and their cases were thrown out. Because the Justice Department did not go in there in a non-con uh, confrontational attitude. They went in loaded for bear, and they accused survivors who were victims of child rape, that they couldn't prove their story because they couldn't remember the day the priest raped them. They couldn't remember little details, but the Justice Department already knew that they were telling the truth because the Justice Department had all the evidence. And so you have claimants, like claimant 
H15019, whose case was thrown out because the Justice Department argued that there was no proof that a predatory pedophile priest was in the institution of St. Anne's when that child was in that building. And what that child, who grew into a man who came and asked justice for the Government of Canada, what he did not know was that the Justice Department had a long list of that pedophile priest. They knew he had been in that building since 1938. From 1938 to 1974, he had free access to the raping of children. And the Justice Department of Canada lied about it in hearings, suppressed that evidence, and had that case thrown out. How could this be happening in 2015, 2016, 2017 in Canada? When the greatest moment that I've seen in the history of this parliament since I've been here was when the previous Prime Minister stood up, Prime Minister Harper, and made that apology. People in my region wept for days when they heard that apology. They never thought that justice would happen, and then they thought it was possible. Just as people wept when our present Prime Minister, at the closing of the Reconciliation mm -hmm. Commission, he gave such a powerful speech that I was sitting there watching him. And he said that Canada would make this right, that the obligation of the survivors to prove what they went through was over, that Canada would be there for them. But that hasn't been the case with the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School, where we've seen that the Justice Department continues to use the brass knuckles approach to deny basic levels of justice. So in the case now, in 2013, I wrote to the Indigenous Affairs Minister and the Justice Minister at the time, and I asked him, who made the decision to suppress the police evidence and testimony that had these cases thrown out? And what will you, as Justice and Indigenous Affairs Minister, do to rectify this clear breach of legal duty? Neither of those ministers, they said they knew about the evidence, they said they weren't accountable to pre presenting the evidence, which was false. So in January 2014, Ontario Superior Court ordered the then previous government, the Justice Department minister, to turn over those documents to the independent assessment process to have those cases fairly adjudicated. And the government refused. They continued to deny. They had to go, the survivors of St. Anne's had to go back to court in 2015. And this time, they were forced to turn over the documents. And what they did was they blacked out the names of the perpetrators and the witnesses to make the evidence functionally useless. For what purpose, in a nation like ours, would the government of Canada opt to protect the pedophile, rapists, and sadists and hide their names? For what possible reason would Justice Department lawyers, the people who are charged with presenting the law for the people of Canada, go into hearings and challenge survivors who suffered horrific levels of abuse? And for what possible reason would the government of Canada decide that they were going to suppress this police evidence? I still haven't figured an answer to that out, Madam Speaker, but it dogs me and I stay up at night trying to figure out what, what kind of person hired to represent Canada would do this. So I applied a simple tool, which is the tool of all parliamentarians, the tool of all Canadians, to ask an access to information request in 2013 regarding the political decisions that went in to suppressing the police testimony and evidence that denied justice to the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School. And I got the first step, Madam Speaker, and for folks back home, when a government doesn't want to answer a question, they give you delays. So we got, I think, a 300-day delay. And we knew this was just an attempt by the department not to have to answer that question because the cases were closing down, the chances of reappeals were closing the ability of the survivors who had their cases thrown out was coming to an end, so it seemed obvious. If the Justice Department dragged us out over three years, well, maybe the cases would be closed and it would be all said and done. And we waited 300 days, 600 days, then they said 900 days, and then the new government came in and I thought, finally, the new government will change.
because they have no reason to oppose the survivors of St. Anne's. And the new government took the position, we will not turn over any of the political documentation regarding the decision to suppress the police evidence at St. Anne's Residential School. That was from our new Justice Minister and our new Prime Minister. So we approached the Access to Information Commissioner, which is again the tool that we use to say, how is it possible that after three years of delay, they could deny and say they are not obligated to turn over this evidence? Because this documentation is about who knew what in the minister's office. And this is a question on a political issue that Canadians need an answer for. And so the Information Commissioner in her office is one of the great institutions of our country. She understood the seriousness of this. This was not a vexatious request. This is about justice. And she challenged the Justice Department. And we were on the verge of being in court with the Justice Department to just find out what was being said in those offices when they suppressed that police evidence. And so the Justice Department agreed to turn over four batches of information over the period of a year. The first batch of information was about 90% blacked out. The second batch of 3,000 pages that we just received were entirely blacked out. So when government says that they want the right to refuse vexatious requests, what they mean by vexatious are the requests that will give them political grief. And they want to be able to turn that down. And so the folks who survived St. Anne's Residential School, the folks who were taken from their families, who had their identity stripped from them, who had their rights taken away, who were left in the hands of abusers and torturers, they have a right to ask why Parliament failed them. And they have a right to ask why the Justice Department of this country continues to deny and challenge them and obstruct their basic rights for redress. And part of those answers may lay in the courts, but part of those answers lie in the access to information request, because we have a right to know who advised the politicians to do this. Because I'll tell you, Madam Speaker, I would like to say that the abuse against the children of St. Anne's has come to an end because of these beautiful apologies, but it hasn't. We now have, in the case of um, Claimant 15-019 and Claimant 14-114. Claimant C-14-114 had her case thrown out because she was unable to prove, because she did not have any documentation, that when she was assaulted in St. Anne's Residential School, she was unable to prove that it was known by administration. And then, after her case was thrown out, she learned that were all these documents, and she attempted to have her case reopened. And the government of Canada said, ah, you can't open your case, you had your case adjudicated. Oh. We're talking about a child victim of rape. What possible reason would the government of Canada challenge? What possible reason would the government of Canada suppress police testimony about child rape? What possible reason would they defy the Ontario Superior Court and black out the names of the perpetrators? What possible reason would they black out all the political documentation going on in the minister's office surrounding this decision? And for what possible reason right now, at this time, would they be in the hearing saying, okay, we've been finally forced to hand over the police testimony, but it's inadmissible. Why is it inadmissible? Well, it's inadmissible because it hasn't been tested. So what they're saying to the survivors is, it doesn't matter that we are having to present 12,000 pages of police documentation of the perpetrators. You, as a survivor, have to go and find a witness to come in and be tested. The trauma that the communities that I represent have lived through because of St. Anne's is the direct highway from St. Anne's Residential School to the suicide crisis of our young people today. You talk to anyone in the communities and they'll say that trauma continues to kill children. And yet, we have Justice Department lawyers saying that evidence cannot be used unless they bring forward a survivor to be re-challenged by the Justice Department. And I'll close on this, Madam Speaker, 
we do have a survivor who's willing to come forward and verify the testimony and the Justice Department says she can't be allowed to speak because she's already spoken. Explain that to me. That is why we need access to information to understand the perfidious nature of what is going on. Questions and